Hello and you're very welcome to Music As, an interview series where I'll be chatting to different people about the role music plays in their lives. I'm Louise O'Connor, a fiddle player from Clare, and I'll be joining the dots between music and lots of different areas. You can listen to the podcast on all the usual platforms and on my website, louise.ie. You can follow at Music As Podcast on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. And please like, subscribe and share the podcast if you enjoy it. I'm delighted to introduce my guest today, the wonderful Tommy Hayes, one of Ireland's greatest baron players. He's a man who's always been full of curiosity and innovation. He's had an incredibly diverse career from being a founding member of Stockton's Wing to blending traditional Irish music with jazz and contemporary influences with Puck Fair and more recently with the Indian musical tradition through Ontara, his collaboration with Matthew Noon. His solo album, A Room in the North, has been described as beautifully eclectic and he uses everything from Tibetan singing bowls to djembe drums and rain shakers. Tommy is a man of the land and a founding member of the Irish Seed Savers Association in East Clare, which was set up by his wife Anita and exists to locate, grow and preserve traditional varieties of food crops. His Apples in Winter CD and film is a fascinating cross between music and agriculture. He records the life cycle of the apple through the seasons while chronicling the apple in music, dance and film and he regards it as one of his favourite projects that he's worked on and it's available from the Seed Savers website. He's also fitted in working as a music therapist for almost 20 years in a diverse range of areas and trained for seven years in the Bonnie method of guided imagery through music. It was fascinating to talk to Tommy about how he uses traditional Irish music therapeutically and how it connects with his experience of improvising as a performer. I'll open the chat with a clip from tr a track called Jim Damps from Tommy's first solo album on Ross, which features an incredible range of guest performers and is available from his band camp. Thank you very much for talking to me today, Tommy. You're very welcome. Well, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Nice to be here. Great. How are you doing there over in East Clare? Oh, I'm grand. We live on, we live on a few acres, so everything is very it's very quiet and peaceful. Yes. Yeah, even without having a lockdown. So yeah, no, I'm grand. Lovely. Yeah. And how has this how has this year been for you? Um, it's been tricky enough. You know, in, especially in terms of music therapy, because when the first lockdown happened, I all my work disappeared because everywhere I had to close. Mm. And since this, since September, I've been back working in mental health, and that's 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 still continuing. But everything else is closed. The school I was working in a few different places. I was working in special needs schools in Ennis, and mm. for no a variety of reasons, I haven't gone back to them. Number one, because there's no room in the schools anymore because they're, they're, they're having problems with the whole social distancing thing. And for me, it, I just felt like pulling back a little bit anyway. So I'm, I'm continuing to work in mental health and I am I will be continuing to work a little bit in special needs. So that's kind of that's kind of the plan. Grant. So, Tommy, you started off, you got into playing trad in your 20s and you've had a very diverse career since then. But before then, when you grew up, you weren't so interested in trad. Could you tell me a little bit about your earlier relationship to, <laughs> to music? I'm glad you've done your research, haven't you? Um, <laughs> yeah, I suppose I was. No, I, 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 funnily enough, I got into trad when I moved to England. I lived in England in, this, mm. in the early 70s. And I had, a, I had a cousin who was married to a guy who played uh, Appalachian Dulcimer. He was quite a famous Appalachian Dulcimer player, actually. And he had an amazing record collection. I used to go on and spend a bit of time with him. And he was mad into Irish music. And previous to that, I would have been into the Beatles, Santana, you know, the usual things that, uh, you know, the young men would be into. And that's that's kind of what got my interest kind of back into playing traditional music. I would have played a bit, I would have played a bit when I was younger, but not that much. Mm. And I and I it kind of yeah started from there in my but I've always had a very kind of very wide view of music. It's not not just not just mm. traditional Irish music because of it. I suppose because of the fact that I didn't start off being as a kid playing it. That I got into it later. Mm. You know, yeah. So I have a very diverse taste, I suppose, in music. Yeah. 
yeah, it's, it's so interesting how you've merged trad with with different fields. And and tell me, how did you get into music therapy? What called you to take music in that direction? Um, I was I was playing and touring with in the Lee Mufflin band, Piper's Call Band at the time, which would have been back in the beginning of like late 1999, early 2000 type of thing. Um, touring and playing with them a lot, and a very enjoyable work actually. One of the nicest bands I've ever played in. And I was chatting to Michal O'Sullivan's secretary, Mag Magda Sullivan, and the Irish World Academy had just, just on the cusp of star, had been going for a couple of years, and I would have been doing the odd, the odd thing for them. And Mag said, oh, we've, we've started this music therapy course. And she, she explained it, it was like, I don't know, I can only describe it like a, like a light bulb moment. You know, I came home and I talked to my wife about it and I applied. It was very difficult to get in, to get in the course because I didn't have, number one, I didn't have a primary degree because I've been on the road since I was in my early twenties. Plus number three was the fact I was primarily a percussionist and in music therapy, you need to be able to play at least guitar and uh, preferably guitar and piano. So <laughs> I had to take, I had to take on all that and had to go through the psychological e examination as well. And, uh, and also that would have been in the early days of seat savers, so that would have been kind of very, you know, intense going as well. But I did get through it. I, I think I collapsed once from the stress <laughs> during the two years. Um, but yeah, I did get through it, and it's something I've never regretted. You know, I I, I love I love it. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Yeah. Brilliant. And so, how has your work changed in in that therapeutic setting like how has it developed i've talked to you a little bit about how your own personal style has evolved they i know it's a long time 20 years to to talk about but could you tell me a little bit about your journey as as a music therapist and i suppose i i, I supervise a lot of students for the, for the course and it's something i say often to a lot of them was was that you know you can you can do all the the book learning in the world you can study every theory that you can possibly get and read every book that's ever written about music therapy but until you actually experience it you don't really get it and, and and for me i think you know you can do the course you can get your masters but then that's when the real that's when the real learning starts it's when you're actually on the ground sitting in some in sitting in a room with somebody with like severe autism and you're trying to make a connection that that's you know and sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't and that's 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 where the real learning is you know and i really i often feel um i, I shouldn't give out about colleagues but i often feel a lot of the people who write mm -hmm. about therapy are seeing it from a, a distorted lens because they've gone into academia and they're writing about uh, um, like therapeutic effects and therapeutic, to therapeutic outcomes but they haven't actually worked on the ground for many many years and i often feel that you know the the actual the work the actual work is the learning the actual work is the studying you know yeah I suppose, I, and i suppose i complain about that but i actually don't i, don't, I write very little myself i freaking hate it <laughs> I mean, I've written, I, you know, I've acted as an, actually funny as someone cited me the other day. I've never been cited before. It was very interesting, but um, yeah. Yeah, I suppose it's hard to talk about music, never mind write about it. You know, like there's like the way music can be such like a, a vessel in therapy. You know, it, it's very hard to compare it to, to anything else. Yeah, I often, I often describe music, music therapy and, and I think music therapy is quite different from a lot of the other creative arts therapies is that there are actually the three people in the room there's yourself and the client and there's the music I, I often see the music as the co-therapist mm. that would be for me would be my kind of my guiding my my guiding principle was that i i see the music as my as my co-therapist mm. and we're working together you know in in in, in, in i suppose using the word triad and dyads and but we are I, I see it as a triad mm. especially as a with the with guided imagery and music, which is something I've studied as well, um, I find that very much so that the music is, is the co-therapist. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, we talked a little bit about the guided imagery in music. Could you tell me a bit about what what exactly that is? What kind of that process is like? Um, well, guided imagery music was developed by a woman called Helen Bonney in America in the 1950s. She developed it after having an experience of music as a I suppose a mystic, she had a, what she described as a, as a mystical experience with music. 
from there she had she was heading for a career as a, a music educator as a performer and from there she changed completely changed her life and and went and studied music therapy which there was only one school of it at the time in the states and um from there she went and and she got a, she got a job with the university of maryland who were doing uh, experiments with lsd on a psychiatric patient and she was hired to de to develop pieces of music that could be used while people were on you know 10 hours of music while for people on on the trip and she discovered that the music on its own without the drug was way more powerful so she's developed this this method of working with music called it's called the bonnie the bonnie method of guided imagery and music and uh, it involves working with a client mostly one-to-one -one. there are there are group modalities in it but mostly one-to-one -one where you you're with a client and will say if you're you are my client will say coming in for a session of gim and we have a chat we discuss what happened in the previous session which was is normally about a month earlier and then we just we decide on an image that we will work with and so the, the client will then normally lay down or get comfortable in a chair close their eyes and i i would the, the therapist me would guide them through a, a guided relaxation which goes on for about eight to ten minutes so you, you do things like you know imagine a golden light and coming down through your body and getting getting people quite quite deeply relaxed from there introduce the image so the image can be something gentle like walking on a beach or it can be getting ready to you know to climb a mountain with your your backpack and your stick and your boots you know depending on on, on what's going on with you and um so that image is introduced and then um helen bonnie devised programs which would be pieces of classical music which had been joined together in a particular way to create different experiences within the subconscious um she had 15 basic but there's a lot more than now obviously and from there the music is played and the therapist sits with the client with a notebook and a pen and the client goes on a journey on their own subconscious and as the, as the session continues the, the therapist will ask the client what they're seeing sometimes some clients are very visual and they have lots of visual images so the clients have body kind of body body kind of sensations it varies from client to client that lasts about 40 minutes of of, of music usually pre-recorded -pre music and then at the end the client is given is if they want they have a, a mandala within a within a a4 sheet and with crayons and they draw the salient image again in silence with without actually discussing what happened and from there then mm. a kind of a general chat about what happened in the session but not too deep client goes away comes back in a month and then there's an in-depth discussion about what happened in the mm -hmm. session it's 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 very deep work it's very intense work but it i find it amazing it, it works i've worked a fair bit with people with sexual abuse and i find and they, it's one of those it's one of those modalities that when you've tried everything else that hasn't worked it's time then to, to go on gim you know because it, it does actually work yeah very much so actually it's quite quite powerful and that's what we were chatting the other day right where you were saying it's pretty similar to the shamanic thing and i was thinking about what you said but it's actually different because of the fact that the client goes on their own journey Whereas in the shamanic journey, the, the shaman goes on the journey, comes back with the message. So it's, it's different in that way, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's amazing the way it's, uh, it's using the power of the imagination really for healing. Mm -hmm. Yes, very much so. Very much so. Yeah, I've had some, I've had some amazing experiences mm. personally on it. Uh, look, luckily, there is another GIM therapist here in the area. There's only about, I think it's only about 10 of us in the oh, whole country. Right. We don't, we don't get a chance very often to to you know because part of the journey the journey is you it's it's a very intense training it's uh a standard it takes about seven years to do it i took a bit longer because again writing <laughs> um and you have to do it's it's quite similar to psychotherapic psychotherapeutic training you have to do about 150 sessions uh supervised and then you have to do personal say a lot of personal sessions yeah. and a lot of writing and a lot of, uh, and, and a lot of a lot of weekends away are traipsing around the world mm. having experiences mm. of it as well so it's quite it's quite intense but it's, yeah definitely it's something i would be see myself as doing more and more as as the years go on you know and i don't have to be hauling around loads of instruments either which is like it's yeah <laughs> It's so it's so interesting the way it's um it's given people resources themselves like to to work with yeah. like particularly yeah. Yeah. 
images, particular images that are accessible to them afterwards. Yeah, they... yeah, very much so. And it's, it's one one thing. Yeah, you 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 start to see common themes in sessions with people. Um, a very common a very common thing with people who've experienced trauma, or or per se abuse. Is that they often travel back to the moment when the abuse happened or before the abuse happened and to actually realize that it wasn't their fault mm -hmm. that's that's a very very common theme in 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 the, in the work with people with abuse is is you know there's always that feeling of guilt or feeling of it was my fault mm -hmm. but often you often see that happening that, that realization happening and that's that's the basis of healing really that's where that's where healing starts mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm sure there's a diverse range of music you use for that kind of therapy, Tommy, is there? Yeah. Very much so, very much so. Um, well, well, traditional guided imagery music would, would use all classical mm. music. A lot of different, uh, a lot of people are using, I have a colleague in Mayo who has put, who has actually done a lot of, a lot of them with neoclassical music, mm. which would be the, the modern Max Richter, I don't know if you know any of those, Olaf Ferrer's. Um, Johan Johansson, mm, people like yeah. that. Um, they're yeah. actually very, very, um, yeah, very powerful as well. And and some sometimes the like the heavy duty classical ones are are, are almost too intense for people. So you have to build them up to you know, take your time getting into those getting into those situations mm. for people. You know, yeah. I'm very interested. Like, what kind of Irish music would you use? Well, the one I put together. Uh, God, I have to remember it now. It'd be it'd be on the Mac. Starts off with actually Steve Cooney playing a, a, a slow piece, a, a harp piece on guitar, and from there goes into the West Ocean String Quartet with Matt Malai. Where does it go from there? I think the Kool Aid Choir, mm. and then West Ocean String Quartet. God, my my memory is doing well here. Please call a space for dreaming, and I finish up with Steve Begley, or oh, Seamus uh, Begley and Steve Cooney doing uh, Broken Caragabani. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's that program. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is there particular instruments you'd be find that would be particularly like evocative or suitable for di for different goals you have? Not really. No, 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 no. It's it's the pieces themselves that that kind mm. of have have the evoc Some some people will say, well, I don't like strings. I don't like this. I don't like that. Mm. And you would always kind of say, fair enough. You know. I mean, I. Well, I know when I started mm. studying it, I used to get really pissed off with, you know, romantic classical music. Hated it, especially when you're in an altered state of consciousness. Couldn't handle it. Um, mm. <laughs> and there are certain problems I just can't stand. I use them, but I don't like them. So, you know, it, it depends on the person. The person, you know, it's, 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 it's again, it's like music therapy. It's, it's all client-centered. It's got to do. It's got to do with with the client's needs and the and the, and, and the client's. Mm. You know, kind of how do I put it? Yeah, client's needs would be would be. Would yeah, be it's all. Yeah. It's it's organic. How the therapeutic relationship, how it develops, is just so individual to every session and to every day. And you know, for all the study oh, that yeah. you do, yeah. you know, you just can't account for what's going to happen when you go in. Mm -hmm. On the day, no, and you can make any, you, you can make all the session plans you like, and five seconds after going in the door, mm. it'll be completely, it'll yeah. be completely gone. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I often say to my students as well that that I think it's a thing we, I think it's a thing we as therapists lose sight of, especially working with with intellectual disability or people who are in difficult situations. That one half hour or hour per week where we work with somebody. Is often the highlight of their week, and we're going and going and dragging out to drag this fucking guitar again. I have to do this, I have to do that, and we don't actually realise the, the the actual. And I've I've seen it on so many occasions, you know, where a client will be walking out the door, especially in mental health, and they'll turn around to me. I remember one fellow in particular said to me, "You actually don't know what this means to me, do you?" And I kind of went, "Gosh, I don't," you know. It's 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 something it's something we as therapists don't don't kind of take on board sometimes or, or comprehend, you know. That's yeah. true. I suppose if you've, you know, if you've been raised with music and immersed in music all your life, like you can almost take it for granted that. Oh yeah. You know. Yeah. Very much so. Yeah. Don't realize, we don't, and I think even as performers, we don't realize the effect we have on people. Mm. You yeah. know, you know, you know, that, that whole kind of making, you know, making somebody feel really happy for, 
you know, an hour and a half or two hours on the, when you don't when Absolutely. you do a gig, you know. It's ther therapeutic in itself to go to gigs even. Yes, absolutely. Live music, there's nothing like nothing yeah. like it, you know. I absolutely. definitely, I know. I, I, this year has been really hard. I haven't been to one gig, and I'm not the only one, obviously. Yeah. But, um, yeah. I, I was wondering, how has your 20 years in therapy, how has that fed into your your practice as well and, and in your performing? I would guess you'd have an even more heightened aware of, of, of what, what you were just saying, like about how healing music can be, you know, even the performances in themselves. Yes and no. I wouldn't, I wouldn't approach a gig as a music therapy session. Yeah. Um, you know, but though I suppose, well, it, it, it often depends on what you're doing or where you're playing. And myself, mm. myself and Matthew, the, the Australian guy I play with plays the Indian music. We often end up playing in places like yoga centers and you know, I remember the first time I played in the yoga center, everybody came out with their blankets and lay down on the floor and their pillows and covered themselves up, you know, sheepskins and their blankets. And I'm going, Jesus, what's going on here? <laughs> but I've, I've kind of gotten used to that a bit now. But, but yeah, so that's a very different scene. And, and I suppose yeah. playing, playing with Matthew, we deliberately kind of tend to play only in small venues. We don't mm. do, we tend not to do big, 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 big gigs, which is something I would have done for many years. We play, you know, we play house concerts where there'll be 40 people. Mm. And it's, 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 I love it. It's just so much more, it's so much more intimate. And mm. you can, you can really connect with an audience because they're often asking you questions, you know, and, uh, yeah. And there's always someone down the back dancing, you know, so it's, yeah, it's quite different. It's quite different. But as a, as a therapist, I do see, I do notice things. I do notice the effect mm -hmm. you will have on people. I don't consciously sit out to do it, but I do. I do see it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. I heard you heard you talk recently about you and Matthew's connection while you're while you're playing, and I love the idea of of music as as, as a really unique connection between people, like when when they're improvising and that. And you were saying how it's kind of beyond the the cultural mm -hmm. now that it's more about that relationship um, between you, how it's developed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I feel that's, I mean, that's the essence of music therapy to me often as well. You know, you can, you can have all the, the explanations you like, but I think often the essence of music therapy is that actual communication that happens within music mm -hmm. between you and a client. You know, that, that, you know, somebody getting that opportunity, number one, to play an instrument, which they probably never have done before. Uh, you know, hand them an open tune guitar, and they're actually making. They're, you know, it's mm. it's it's in tune. So they're tuning. They're they're in tune with their body, and then you're playing the same, and they, you're in tune with them, and it's something they've probably never experienced mm. before. And and that, that that's that sense of communication that happens between musicians you often see on stage when you're watching two or you've experienced it yourself, where you know where somebody's going to go mm. even before it happens, because you ha you have that connection, you have mm. that link. And I think that's the essence of music therapy as mm. well, is that means of communication. It, it requires a lot of presence, doesn't it? Yeah, very much so. I mean, as a therapist, well, as a therapist, you, you do, it requires, it's, you know, <laughs> you often get the, the thing that people are saying, especially with the guided imagery, because I'm actually sitting there, but I'm working, you know, you're working really hard, you know, you know you're, it's really hard work. Uh, mm. Even though you, you look like you're not doing much, but you you have that you have you have to be there you have to be really mm. aware and really in the space mm. yeah I suppose there's there's a lot of work in getting you to that point of being able to be that present either in improvising or in a therapeutic relationship mm -hmm. like, isn't there? well and, well and, I mean therapeutic relationship is, is got to, a lot to do with mm. improvising as well I think that's the difficulty classical musicians have with becoming music therapists is they have a really hard time they find improvising really difficult because they've been trained in such a way that, you know, being outside mm. the box is really difficult for them, you know, um, and improvisation is the essence, again, another of the essence of music therapy, because you have to react to what's mm. coming in front of you. So being yeah. a baron player, having such an ex extensive career prepared you well <laughs> for the therapeutic relationship. <laughs> <laughs> Probably did, I don't know, I don't know, yeah, yeah. It's funny, I don't use baron much. In music therapy, no, most mostly the main thing I would play a big guitar, guitar and singing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I suppose that idea of responding immediately to what's what's in front of you, what's what's around you, as well. I suppose you're right. That's a good point. As a bowron player, that or as a percussionist, that that is something you would you definitely mm. have to do because you're 
you're an accompanist mm. and you're 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 cluing into what yeah that's right it's a good point i never thought about that yeah. you're, you're actually cluing into what the, the melody player is doing because that's that's your job that's what you have yeah. to do and i was wondering as well in in your relationship with matthew and in this in this project at the moment you know you talked about a kind of a a journey from it being about the irish and indian music to being a more organic thing that's about the individual about the personal between you and i was just wondering like how how does that relationship develop? Like, I know that there is, as we said, it requires a lot of presence, but could you tell me a little bit about how that developed between you? Um, gosh, well, well, I suppose in practical terms, um, Matthew just lives down the road and I, I've been living in East Clare for about 20, um, longer, 30 odd years now. Um, and I'm not a person who kind of, who's into playing in the pub. It's not, it's not my thing. It's not something, you know, I might go once or twice a year. But Matthew every year has a um, an all night session on Hindu goddess of music on her on her, on her feast day, and it, it goes on all night. And he, I, I don't know, I even know how I got invited to it, but I did. And we sat and we started playing together, and we kind of realised, or he, you know, he asked me a few weeks later would I be interested in doing some, you know, some playing with him. And I, you know, funnily enough. When I started doing music therapy, I didn't actually do any gigs for a number of years because I was just so caught up in the whole world of music therapy that I didn't have the headspace or, or the energy to do it. So I was kind of getting to the stage where I where I wanted to maybe have a couple of. I mean, I did. I had a number of projects, but they were all projects that I would have, you know, been involved in myself that I would have put together for my own, like like apples of winter, like the film I did, or a couple of the solo projects, so a couple of the solo album projects, but. I hadn't really been playing on a regular basis with anybody for a number of years. And I, I, I found what he was doing really interesting. And I suppose, how do I put it this diplomatically? I'm at an age where I don't really want to play with people that I don't get on with. <laughs> um, you know, I've, I've, I've played in loads of bands. I've played on hundreds of records and I'm. I'm. As, I really am. I mean, I, I'm not. I'm not financially at a stage where I can say I don't want to do this. But I'm. I'm emotionally at a stage where I will say, no, I'm sorry, I don't want to do that. And I found we we got even though he's you know he's what's he, 20, 20, 25 years younger than me. We all, we actually got on really well. We kind of have the same ideas about music. We have a very similar musical vision. And I've always been. I've always been very interested in in music that's left the field. You know. Probably to the detriment of my of my income, but that's okay. That's that's not that's not what it's yeah, about it's really. A lot of the time. Project, and you you ended up going to India as well. We did, yeah, yeah. I'll never forget that. That was, that yeah. was wild. <laughs> <laughs> I think my heart was in my mouth for the whole time. You know, I was trying to put trying to, the driving. Mother of God, the driving. That was then my my most abiding memory. But, and and the, the gigs we were doing were mm. quite extraordinary because we were we were playing with this guy who was a Vina player. And his whole purpose in life these days is to bring music back mm. into the temples. So we were playing concerts in these, you know, I remember one place was a seventh century temple that had been hand carved out of granite. And this place was enormous and had a tree growing in the middle of it. it went all through the roof, you know, and we played at five in the morning for a puja. And then we played a concert in the evening, you know, and, and so it was quite, it was quite extraordinary. It was quite an extraordinary trip. Yeah. yeah. I suppose that and probably Mongolia were the two most the two the two most interesting places I've ever been. Yeah. Wow. You've yeah. constantly had this like curiosity, haven't you, Tommy, to just keep delving into different um different areas and kinda pushing the boundaries, I suppose, of the, the jazz. Yeah, I suppose I have actually, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I have. I've always been very interested. I've always been very lift of field and I've always been very interested in, in pushing boundaries, yeah. Yeah, very much. You so. mentioned there your apples in winter project. I found it very interesting as well how you were how that project was so shaped by your your environment, like there in in Clare, and it was also yeah. pushing the boundaries, like as well in terms of like connecting music and and agriculture. Could you tell yes, me a little bit about so. that project? Oh God, um, okay, that that came about when I. It started when uh, Claire, the Clare Arts Office put out a call to um, people to come up with some ideas for projects that the Clare Arts, Clare Arts could fund. And I, this is something I had in the back of my mind for a while, because number one, 
I suppose with my connection to seed savers and my connection to apples, I've always had, a, I've always been a really fan of apples. Um, my grandfather was an apple grower. He, 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 he was a grafter. I taught myself how to graft apple trees when, at, in the early days of seed savers, because I had nowhere to learn from. And it, so I came up with this, this idea of having getting well I approached the Clare Arts Club about it and they said sorry that's way too big we can't we can't afford to do that and they mm -hmm. put me onto the Arts Council in Dublin and the Arts Council funded it. Um, <clears throat> so I spent I spent a year with a filmmaker a fellow called Fergus Tig where we 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 catalogued mm -hmm. the whole year in, in silent film and for apple growing. So a whole year of, in an orchard between grafting and planting and harvest and et cetera, et cetera. We made that. And then what I did was I spent, I spent quite a bit of time uh, researching music that was all associated with apples. So uh, got that together, put hired, hired lore for an after, for a day, got a, got a bunch of musicians together, people I had worked with previously and people I really admired. Um, and a couple I hadn't worked with before, but again, whose work I really admired and the likes of Karen Casey and Mick O'Brien. Michelle McCallie, et cetera, Mary Frances Keenan. And we spent about, I don't know, we didn't have many rehearsals. We had five or six um, where we put together this, this hour long show and all the music was associated with apples. So we, we did three, we did a, a rehearsal, we did two rehearsals that we filmed and we did a live concert. And we put up these three giant screens in Glore and projected the, the silent film onto Joe's and then had the concert while the film was being projected. Mm -hmm. So all the music was associated with apples and it was, a, it was a one continuous piece and we filmed that. And then I had the, the, the fun job of editing that, which took quite a while. But yeah, I'm, I'm very pleased with that project. One of, of, the, of all the projects I've done, it's probably one of my favorites. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a beautiful response to, to your surroundings, like to your... Yeah. 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 And, and, and I suppose, I, I suppose the land, I, I suppose I, I've always been really interested in landscape and music, you know, like East Clare, yeah. especially, uh, as you know yourself, the music, yeah. the music is very similar to the landscape. It's very flowing and very gentle. Whereas in West Clare, where, you know, just, just to take one county where the land is a lot more rugged, the, the music is very similar, you know, it's got that feel to it. So yeah, I'd I've, I've had another, I have another notion in my head of another one I'd like to make. So if I can get the funding, I might, I might, I might go at that as well. But they're, they're, they're a lot of work. They're like 99% organizing and, you know, 1% creativity. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Brilliant, Tommy. We'll, we'll look forward to that for sure. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. We'll see. Yeah. So just to kind of, to sum up in a way, I suppose, for someone, someone at home who mightn't have access to, to music therapy, would, would you have any advice for people of, of how they might use music in, in a way to manage stress or to yeah to kind of how how could people use music as healing or as therapy themselves like at home um find, find something that you really resonate with find a piece of music that you really resonate with you know and and, and, and you know i mean gosh sometimes it doesn't really matter what type of music but if it's very energetic and you're trying to de-stress Sometimes that works, you know. I always, re I always remember I was at a, I took my son, my son to a, and his friend to a Red Hot Chili Peppers gig, and I saw people getting really emotional with this really intense kind of energetic, you know, very edgy music. Mm. It made me think a lot about about the types of music. You know, I think mm. if you find something you can resonate with, there are some, there are some, um, th some things up on li online. And there's actually, a, a, I, myself and a friend did a, a, a 15 minute relaxation thing to music that's up on YouTube with, with, some guided, with some guided relaxation in it. From silence into a musical space. And that has, I think, one original piece by the two of us, West Ocean String Quartet, who I adore, and a piece by Steve Cooney. And just 15 minutes, uh, just 15 minutes relaxation mm. and a guided one, it's up there. Um, but you know, there's loads of other stuff out there. There's loads of music for. I think you know, I'm a bit wary of some of the music they use for relaxation. I particularly, well, personally, I don't. I think some of it's not very good. There, are, there are there are things to find if you if you look. You know. Mm. It's been absolutely lovely to talk to you, Tommy, about some of your musical adventures. <laughs> 
Well, yeah, it's been a few of them already. Yeah, <laughs> we could talk for several more hours, I'd say. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you very much for for talking to me today. Oh, you're welcome. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Brilliant. Yeah, that was fun. Thank you for listening to the Music As podcast. I hope you enjoyed the chat today with Tommy. You can follow Music As podcast on all the social media outlets. And don't forget to share, like and subscribe to the podcast.